In today's episode, we discuss the new normals of online play, the power of pursuing secrets, and embracing tragic consequences. This is the DM Shower Thoughts. Welcome back. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the DM Shower Thoughts, the show where we talk about our shower thoughts in 5th edition Dungeons and & Dragons and uh, tabletop scenarios, how to become your best self through gaming. My name is Adamus. I'm John. And I'm Ian. There Woo! he is. All right. So we're going to kick things off with some uh, shower thoughts. We got a whole list of things to talk about. And um, mm. John, kick us out. Yeah, so this is uh, largely, uh, probably, I, I very selfishly, probably, I'm going to, this is going to be our main thing today, <laughs> but really, uh, uh, there, is a, there is a game that I played, uh, it's a few weekends ago now, but um, there was a lot of lessons that were all kind of packed in to that one six-hour session, um, and, and as we kind of go through all, like, the things that came out of it, I wanted to get your thoughts, opinions, feelings, feedback. Um, all that stuff, just kind of listening to it. So um, just to kind of like frame the whole conversation, uh, I started a campaign recently, which is structured like a series of one shots, very similar to uh, to Night Owls, which is uh, which is a long going um, format that Adam has been running for a few years. I, I stole a lot of the structural things right from that. Um, and really, the idea is that even though it's a campaign that may, uh, where each session might influence other sessions, each story is relatively self-contained. There's a beginning, middle, and end. And even um, if there's like a cliffhanger or an unresolved plot hook that can continue into the next section, there's still a definitive end where you've accomplished something by the end of each session. So, um, so really, um, the other thing is this this campaign has been designed for Roll20 that, um, you know, before the pandemic, usually we did table, like at the table kind of gaming, but because of COVID, we've had to learn online gaming. Um, and online gaming does have a few problems. Um, it really, like like Adam has mentioned this in, a, in, a, in an episode a few, few podcasts back maybe, but this was like the first game I experienced where internet uh, connectivity was oh, a yeah, really big issue. Actually, this is hole. funny. Yeah, I'm in a different. It I'm was in a different. My saving grace in this. <laughs> it was uh, so. <laughs> this is my sister Stephanie. I'm actually Hi. recording in her apartment. She gets to listen to my podcast process for the about, first time about the game that I was a part of. Yeah. So, uh. um, but even with the the internet problems that came up and the whole like oh now we have to wait to connect and everything i found that i don't think i'm going to dm without roll 20 or without some kind of online tool set uh even when the pandemic is over mm. um which is i might be a controversial decision for a lot of people we game with but to me one of the things that it's done is allow clarity of information because there's a written record of everything going on that we can refer back to, um, there's there's no there's a the lack of commu or uh, any sort of miscommunication gets cleared up almost instantly, you know. So it's not what say it louder for the Some, people in the back. Yeah. So and, and at the table, how many times has this happened where it's like somebody goes up to use the bathroom, they come back, and because they weren't there when stuff was happening they don't really absorb the new information or they might miss something. I yeah. can't tell you, and this is how, and again, anything I talk about today, this is not singling out play, uh, like specific players. I've seen these behaviors and I've seen um, these situations in a variety of contexts where I'm the dungeon master, where I'm not the dungeon master, all that stuff. Um, there's, there were a lot of times where it was like, um, somebody would either go to the bathroom and come back and be like, what happened? And I could just be like, scroll up a little and read. Like it's right there. You don't have, yeah. it's not a mystery what's going on. And that's the beauty of recording the ongoing events of the campaign in chat. Even if you're preferring um, more of like a, 
like an audible approach, you know, where you're speaking, having some, I've seen Ian do this, where we'll have a conversation like we are right now, but Ian will jot some notes down in chat, mostly for himself. So it's like, you know, he's not recording the audio to have to skim through, yeah. but if he wants to do a, a quick recap at the beginning of the next session, he has very definitive notes that he can reference. Yeah. And so, what I've been figuring out with all of this um, very recently, I'd, I followed the, the lead that, that John showed out with this, uh, this campaign that he was working on, um, which is to create a living document. And I have dozens of notes uh, detailing the, the very heavy and immersive cloak and dagger campaign of Grey Owls, of book one, of campaign one. It's going for nearly three years now. And I have players who keep very diligent notes, but even that, they'll take things and blend them or mm. oh, i thought you said that this is related to that and like no it isn't uh yeah. but instead of me having to clarify that and then having an assumption or some sort of you know, whiplash of that information by having the living document it's this is what this guy's name is this is the faction he's in and this is what he does this is how you know him uh this he showed up in these chapters it's like i have a running record now of everything compiled from the last 19 chapters which are more than 19 sessions and there, that's a lot of content. And then I have summaries of every single chapter. So if you need to go back and go, wait, who was that guy? You can see in the chapter where he was. And when I'm dealing with all that information, it has been extremely helpful, even just to introduce it uh, in kind of late game. And like, here's the compilation of all these notes just yeah. in case you need them, because better late than never. And it's been so, so powerfully helpful that going forward to, future campaigns, my weekly campaigns, anything like that, I want to do that as a, as a running record, Roll20 or not, just to have a, a, a written record. This is pretty cool because uh, I just did the trial run of my SCP Foundation one-shot uh, with a group of friends that I only know through online. And uh, in, that, in that session, it was a two-part session. It turned into 10 hours total uh, because they they were having so much fun they decided to explore parts of the setting that i hadn't really prepared for um and so i had to like kind of improvise and figure out like okay i've thought about this but i haven't really solidified it i guess it's the time to do it mm -hmm. um and uh by having uh the roll tony chat uh in the end i uh put a lot of different like notes and things like uh it was really useful to my players as well um as particularly one player she really uh, enjoys taking notes. And so for her own sake, she was like, uh, yeah, just make sure you put that in the chat every time I said something new that I didn't have like a full blown description for. And so it, it is really useful for exactly the reasons you guys are saying. Um, but even for just like people who, who want to take notes and want to have like even exact wording sometimes. Yeah. So it's, uh, it, it's definitely, I'm right there with you. So. <laughs> Yeah, and as a final point before we kind of move on from this, um, the the other reason I've found personally that I really prefer online play to at the table play is um, because I recently got a new laptop for my birthday. Super cool. But because of that, there's a mobility with the game that you don't have at the table. So, like, if you're mm -hmm. committing to a Saturday night game, like, when – when we're playing, you know, at the martial arts studio, um, we're like locked in a specific place and I get sore really easily. Um, I, I don't have the ability to really move. It, you can move around and stuff, but it's not the same, you know, where it's like, you can't just go into my kitchen and grab food in the middle of a game, you know, or if there's something that, uh, or if I need to go to like lay down, like I like just laying down in my bed while we're playing or, uh, or moving, you know, moving to different spaces that will accompany what the position my body needs to be <laughs> to experience the most comfort and uh and not have that that whatever discomfort of sitting too long um you know not having that be an, an interruptive factor in my immersion in the experience does that make sense yeah. so even uh like i i was playing and recording um in my wife's uh my wife's library with her desktop even playing like a five six hour game there was driving me bonkers. You can, you two can attest to the amount of times I would just get up and leave for like 10 minutes because I just needed to walk around. And, you know, a lot of the spaces we were playing in, 
the the quarters were too tight to just do that. Just get up and pace and walk. It's actually funny. If you watch me like on the phone, I pace too. Like I can't just sit down and have a phone call. I'm making figure eights or I'm walking around. It's like, like I, I can't sit still and do it. I've got to be moving, which mm-hmm. is a really, really kind of interesting idiosyncrasy. But um, I just find really Dungeons and Dragons is a game about communication and just the clarity of having an in-text log to clarify everything that everyone can, can go back to um, and being able to move while I'm communicating have been like saving graces throughout this, uh, this period. And I've enjoyed it so much. I don't think I'll go back. Um, I like both. <laughs> I, I'm enjoying the freedom that I have to write things uh, when I'm doing these things online. But um, I do find that being at the table for me is also really energizing because I like having the people in the room. And we've talked before about like the pros and cons of, of being at the table versus being online. Um, and I think for me, I just have like, it's in my nature to be able to adapt to both kinds of situations. Um, I think one of the downsides to how I was doing, uh, how I was doing the at the table before was that I didn't have these descriptions that I really am enjoying now. And so uh, there was a lot more uh, off the off the cuff descriptions and, and uh, improvisations of of where we are and who that is and how they talk. Um, but I I like uh, I like what Roll Twenty has driven me to do and how it's changed the way I DM, um, especially since it was so early on. <laughs> so, Online play yeah. has a, has clarified for me a lot more of the visual. Uh, of things like because I have to make covers and I have to find concept art or I have to find something that's close to what's in my head so that there's a visual representation and there's a I was looking for art yesterday for a scientist and in my original description she had black hair but the uh, her child has red hair and it's like wouldn't it be cool if there was a through line so I went and revamped all my art trying to find a, a redheaded person uh, for this and it made it much more uh, synchronous but it's just to think more and more about that visual, especially when you have a theater of the mind, but you have this as a visual in Roll20, it has upgraded the uh, level of description. Now, when I play with people, uh, often I'm actually, uh, I'm, like before uh, quarantine, I was actually doing a lot more of going to people's homes, being invited into their homes, bringing all my things with me and like making custom miniatures in this 3D aspect, things they can touch and use that are specifically for their campaign. And there's a certain level of immersion that that really speaks to certain people. And then there's an organic energy that comes from being in your safe space, your home, your basement, whatever it is. Uh, and playing a game together. I'll have people stand up and walk around from there, but they it's a different kind of energy that they have expressed they don't get that same energy being online. However, in more recent times, by me adjusting and upgrading uh, what I'm doing and how I'm presenting things, finally getting used to Roll20, we're starting to achieve that again. We can't you know, get to each other and you know, high five or go, oh my gosh, that was so amazing, you know, mm-hmm. one-on-one, like talking like human beings, but we can whisper to each other, holy cow, that was so cool. We can connect still on a human level now that we've all bought into this format. So, yeah, and, and to kind of go off of that, um, just like how we talk about players have different styles, there's obviously been a lot of research done in a variety of fields about like personality types And I think that this kind of format for people that tend to be more empathetic or more emotionally sensitive, having a like physical space and a boundary of the internet and everything has really kind of hampered their experience or their expectations of what D&D is. Um, uh, I've always thought of myself more as a writer than an actor if we were to like allocate stats. So for, for people who enjoy acting and being in character and energizing that way, this is gonna be a more interruptive format to that. People who more like writing, and actually we found that, um, you know, there's a, there's a fellow player we have, uh, other Stephanie, that um, felt like she could express different parts of her character. She would be too uncomfortable with this if she was in a room trying to say it out loud or act it out, as opposed to just writing a description, this is what my character says, or this is how my character acts. 
So, um, so I do think that for some player, like I'm finding I'm the kind of player who would rather write it out than act it out. Like, like you said, Adam, I actually, I like world 20 better because I don't have to invest as much in minis. I'm actually the opposite, but also that that'll speak to my personality type, you know, where now I'm not spending $20 on minis. I just make a token, you know, and I don't have to spend money printing out visuals. I just drag the visual. And if there's a visual that I need that I didn't think of, you just Google it on the spot. Yeah. And you just, there's a, there's a better reaction to it, you know? So, and, and again, this is like a personal preference thing. It's not a judgment on there's a right way to play D and D. Um, it's just something that I've really kind of discovered, uh, especially now that, like I said, this is, this was the fourth session um, of this new campaign. And I've finally gotten a, enough under my belt that I'm kind of comfortable with it, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and kind of moving on with that. Um, so it was really interesting because this was a, this was a session where there's a lot of use of the whisper functionality. I had a lot of very different reactions to the fact that there was a good, I want to say 45 minute section of the game that was almost purely in whispers. So if you looked at the chat log, for most players, there was like nothing going on. <laughs> so, and, um, and, and I got a few reactions. First, which was, oh my goodness, this is so amazing. I like that my character has secrets and that my character is doing things on their own and that it feels like they have so much more agency because they get to choose what they're doing. They're not bound by what the team's goals are. They get that kind of layer. I got the opposite reaction, which is, I can't see anything going on. Why aren't we communicating as a team? Which is where I was falling kind of in gray owls. So, um, so again, it does speak to, uh, and, and with Gearus, which is the name of this latest campaign, there are slight swap outs with some members. It's not like it's, there's two pretty consistent teams kind of operating at the same time, but there's a little bit of back and forth. Like Ian has kind of played with both games. And, and there was one player who wasn't used to this other team's dynamic. So it was really interesting how if you swap two players, how that creates a complete change in dynamic and a complete change in storytelling. Secrets are a, an cool part about upgraded play, in my opinion. Um, maintaining a secret uh, and not letting it be uh, the, like the chip on your shoulder is is really cool and having that secret spoiled is a huge break in a breach in trust uh for for many players if they're really trying to keep that secret like if have the if the dm goes oh yeah you you noticed that so yeah that's that secret's out like that sucks um <laughs> you'd really much rather have that be a part of that person's agency but we we ran into it uh, a little bit when I was trying to make an immersive experience by having lots of whispers with different players, uh, like certain dream sequences or things that they were seeing. Um, but then they would respond with whispers. And but if you look at the chat log for say Solomon, Solomon's driving the ship, he didn't see anything, and that was you know boring for him um, because he didn't get to really play. Uh, and that's, um, it's a difficult thing to try and balance because if you're going to whisper and have a lot of whisper, uh, it's like, you need to make sure you're whispering with everyone, mm. uh, so that everybody has something to interact with. And that was right at before my burnout when I needed to take a break. But, uh, that was the main lesson to take away from there. So if you're going to use the whisper function, it is my recommendation that if you're going to have an extended period of whispering, that you are whispering everyone something. Uh, or if there's someone that has all the common knowledge, but everyone else is busy doing whispers, uh, that's also a thing. That, that's one of the things I actually kind of like about table stuff. The whisper function is really nice and it facilitates a lot of the things we couldn't do before. However, if people are feeling left out, that's where I feel the table uh, element is much more conducive to like a satisfying story because uh, then everyone sees what happens as players, even if their characters don't. And, and like, there's always going to be a secret that's like, well, it's better off that only that person knows it, but it can be really exciting to, to, as a player to observe how other characters are, are uh, unfolding in their story. Kind of like with Rowan uh, in, I think, two sessions ago or something, 
she had a really interesting dream sequence. And I said it was better off to have it um, kind of publicly um, so that everybody could see the weird stuff that goes on in this vision. And even uh, during that vision, we kept having uh, people interrupt and go, wait, do I see that? I go to the door. Like, this is a vision. This yeah. is only for this <laughs> I think person. that happened like two times or something. <laughs> two, two or three, times. yeah. I was like, did we miss the premise of this? <laughs> like, <laughs> that's always funny to me. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's always figure, like using the whisper function. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And it's just a matter of figuring out when it is appropriate to use it. I agree. I think uh, that you should, if, if you're having a lot of whispering going on, then it should be like everyone should have their own whisper thing. Um, but when you have six players, sometimes that can be a little tougher. So, uh, you know, ups and downs for each. Yeah, it was, it was less, I think it was, and actually this is, this is your feedback, Stephanie, so you can chime in. But um, I think it was less that there was, like it was less that you were feeling left out because you were having whispers at the same time. It was more just that the team wasn't really communicating. It was more that I just was feeling lost. Like if my whisper conversation kind of ended and there was just kind of like, from my end, I just thought nothing was happening. If yeah. Other people were still talking. So it was more just like, like it'd be nice to have like a heads up of like, I'm going to have a whisper conversation right now. Yeah. Just to like, or, or just, like, letting us know that it's not just a stalemate and you're yeah. not waiting for us to do something. Yeah. Yeah, you, so, you and, need a clarification was, of what's dead air and what yeah. is I'm still talking to people. Right, and that, that was one of the things that definitely came up was, you know, everybody pretty much had a – because it was, we're all going to split up gang and look for clues. So they, they were in all in different parts of kind of the, the area, right, um, and just some of them resolved their thing faster than others you know and then some of them tried to tried to inappropriately butt in on other people's conversations and stuff and yeah. so it was just it was just kind of a management thing from there because remember as the dm if you're having whisper conversations with everybody that means you're having four times as much dialogue as if you have a four person party than each player is having um now i i don't i'm not sure i quite buy that secrets are necessary to have a higher level of play oh no 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 they're not necessary yeah. i mean that they are a, a pry um an element of higher level play or a, I, like, I would say like a symptom like it's a sign okay. that you could be because i have seen players very unskillfully implement secrets yes and i have also seen i've also had really successful high level games without any secrets yes so um yeah i'm not I, saying I am, it's a requirement yeah, I, I do. To do them correctly would be a, a sign of higher level play. Yeah, and that's that's the yeah. thing I, I've definitely found is uh, there's been times where there have been little secrets kind of let out so far in the game. And usually, like I even did it before your guys' next session um, for this, which is I, I text the player or I, I whisper to the player like, listen, your secret could be let out. Is this an appropriate time to let this secret out? And also, just to be really clear, I want this to be a secret, you know? I don't want people to know this. And, of course, you also don't want to disservice the other players who and their agency if they understand that there's a secret and they want to find it out, you know? Because that's, that's a different thing, is now if it's like, if I'm, say I'm playing an investigative character who doesn't trust people and is like, you have a secret, that might get us killed. Is there any way you can confirm you're not going to get us killed? Because in character, I've been backstabbed enough times. Literally, here's the here's the scar that I don't want to die. Are you someone I can trust or can't trust? And I yeah. think that's that's where the complication comes in. You know, is is how do you how do you get into the middle where you're you're like this player has a secret, but it's not a secret that is going to negatively detriment your character. You know, there was a so this came up uh, in, in recent growls um, for for Team Tree that we had a, a secret, um, and when we we when it occurred that there would be a secret, the it was um, during live play, uh, so before before quarantine, and the uh, character was given a deal 
and took that deal. And, and the players are all aware this is happening, but characters are not. And, but Grails is a cloak and dagger campaign. We've been almost having a running joke about how your perception scores are freaking amazing. And your insight, your passive insight is insane. And uh, even if your deception scores are really, really good, it's pretty easy to at least tell by body language that something might be up. But then on top of that, having uh, players say, I really want to keep this a secret, and then having them say to the party something that goes against everything they've been building toward, which sounds suspicious. And it's, it's like, I'll, I'll help you keep that secret, but also you need to be secretive. And if you're in a campaign of, in, of inquisitive people and they're running insight checks on you and I'm like, you need to do a deception check if you want to keep this a secret. Like they're, they're actively trying to figure out something's wrong, what's wrong, and they're confronting you. This is also a cloak and dagger campaign that they have been doing this for many, many chapters. And it's a difficult balance to make because you don't want the player to have their secrets spoiled. But at the same time, how do you not even reward the players that are that are trying to figure things out, but they know something's up? And how do you then make sure that they're acting on clear triggers in the game world, but they're not metagaming, going like, why well, am I'm automatically suspicious because I know as a player he made this deal. But if there's a clear reason and there's a logical through line, we need to also, as players and DMs, be able to separate that so people's feelings don't get hurt. Yeah, I, I think that they're, um, and, and that might be a thing where metagaming is like the most useful solution to this, which is kind of like, uh, I can't remember who, who, I think it was Cody from Taking 20, was mm -hmm. saying like, he was role playing a paladin, very standard lawful good paladin, and his friend was role playing a, a rogue, very standard, I steal things from the chest before the party gets to it rogue. Mm -hmm. So he realized as, as a player, the way this person wants to have fun in this game is to try to, you know, steal things out from under their chest. So he said, let's stop for a second. As a player, I know you want to have your fun. So the way we'll justify this, if the DM is okay with it, the paladin notices like the chest just like a minute after you already steal the thing. So like my play, the, this is how my character would react knowing that your character is doing this thing behind their back. As a player though, I respect that you want to have this kind of fun or it might bring yeah. up this kind of conflict. So, yes. um, so, so, and that's where it's like, it can be, especially in an emotionally charged information driven game, it can be hard to separate the player and the character. And if the player is willing to have the cognition to step out of the character role for a minute. And this is this can be hard with players that enjoy acting, you know? Yeah. To say, listen, I want to accomplish a secret thing. Um, I know your character's investigative. Is there some way you as a player can justify it to yourself for your character to not do this thing, you know? <laughs> then I think that that ends up being kind of the healthiest solution because now you're kind of finding that win-win. You know, right. where the character isn't acting suspicious, which would trigger another character to then investigate. You're, you're agreeing as players the way that everybody's going to have the most fun, you know? Yeah. And it, it's strange because uh, I've, I've had it happen a couple uh, different games and it has resolved in many different ways. But having players come to me saying, I want to keep this a secret, like, okay. Yeah. And then I'll make sure that I'm not giving them opportunities for that secret to come out. And then they reveal it to another player or another, another character, excuse me. And then that character blabs it and ruins it, it to everyone else. Mm. And then they'll look at me like, why didn't you stop them? Like, uh, you're not a mind reader either. I don't know what they, you're going to do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think this does speak to uh, a certain design element when you form a secret that mm. if you're a player that is that's like that is committed to keeping a secret like design your secret with stages that you could drip out information in uh, so that if a character starts to pursue your secret you give them just enough to satisfy them but without getting the whole picture 
you know? So a lot of times as Solomon, especially having grails, I had a lot of trouble as a player and as a character because I have all these people who are murder hobos that, uh, <laughs> that, ha- that are acting recklessly that aren't, that are keeping secrets. And it's like, as a, it turns out Solomon's a lawful good character. I think Shelly was the first one to say that. And it's pretty <laughs> true. Um, yeah. A lawful good character in, in, in a band with murder hobos trying just to keep everybody alive, you know? I'm going to ask questions. So if I ask a question and you're like, you're not allowed to know, that's not going to be like, oh, well, I guess it's fine then. <laughs> like, like, it's like, it's like being able to talk out that thing either in game or out of game, but just understanding the psychology behind it, you know? Does that make sense? <laughs> no, that does make sense. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of this, a lot of, a lot of the problems that uh, I've, I've seen in, in old times and recent times, and the main things that come up are always resolved by us going, whether it's in play or out of play, maybe during a break of us stepping outside of the game. Like I'll step out of the side, outside of the game and say, guys, I'm having a really hard time balancing this encounter because I think I gave you items that were really powerful. I'm just letting you know that. I'm not going to nerf them, but this, are you okay if this creature has some, some extra abilities because I think I made you overpowered? Or having a player step outside the game and say, just so you know, guys, I'm okay. We're okay. I'm just playing the character, and he's yeah. pissed at you all, but we're fine. Goes a long way to make sure everybody's more comfortable at the table. And I don't mean just do that all the time to make sure everyone's comfortable. It's just, if you get the sense that it's kind of tense, then you can just say one thing and we get back into the game. Uh, In the SCP one shot, my uh, party members wanted to make some sort of item, uh, like a flamethrower. And uh, I let them. Uh, (laughs) They they were doing some really creative stuff that they just wanted to work around it. I, I ended up giving the item the stats of a level 11 produced flame and they're level five. <laughs> and uh, the only way I could figure out how to balance it, I could, I could tell you a little bit more later. I don't want to ruin anything in the one shot. The only way I could figure out how to balance it was just to say, you can only use it every other turn. So I was like, this is a cool thing, but you can only use it once every other turn because it recharges yeah. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's just interesting when that happens. Yeah. And actually, um, as a player, uh, I kind of played with this idea too. Um, and, and I do know in Gears, there are players that have secrets where they're using this strategy as well, which I thought was kind of cool, which is give them enough of a taste that you have a secret and then leave it up to the party whether or not they want to investigate it. So like in Ian's campaign that just resolved, which is going to be the next podcast episode of the episode after, because that was a really cool ending, dude. Um, You know, I was playing a cleric that was possessed by a vampire. So like there would be times where I would be in the, we would be in the middle of combat, like a few sessions in and he'd be like overcome with bloodlust or his personality would start switching. So now it's like, there's, you get the sense something is off. Do you want to investigate? Do you want to dig further? And most of the players ended up opting not to. So then the next one, it's like he, after he kills one of the the enemy bandits, he starts sucking their blood. Do you want to investigate? And they're like, no. So it's like, so, so that way the secret is kept because it's, I, I, as the player, I left it up to the party. I gave them a hook that they could pursue. So if they, as players, they now have the choice if they want to pursue that secret. And I'm actually in control of how much information gets kind of kind of put away at one point, you know? If you leave it up to the player with the secret to describe how their secret manifests, then they never, they get to control if it's spoiled or not, you know? So and it, it depends on what kind of secret. Is an anatomical secret? Like, you know, is, is Cole Warforged? That's one kind of secret. That got spoiled just because he died. <laughs> <laughs> and the party had to try to revivify him. Is it a backstory secret? How would the party figure that out unless the player character tells them, you know? Yeah. So uh, something comes up that from that backstory that triggers. Yeah. yeah. And and this uh and actually I liked what you said, Adam, which is it resolves by stepping out of out of character. And and a lot of these next two things are things that I had in the back of my head, and it made me realize 
I need to step out of the game between sessions to really solidify this. So the first one is, uh, is the, the way I've been using backstories in this latest campaign, which is um, each, almost every player character is, is really cool because they come from a different part of the world, which isn't something I, I expected. It's just something that was kind of cool that happened. So Adam's orc character, Fennec, comes from uh, Kolvik, right which is like this uh this orc stronghold very warrior city um you know and ian's character moo who's a warforged uh was trained in the in the titanwood which is where the fae live the two very different areas and basically what happens is when the party goes to that area i like set up that player in advance with this is what your character knows because that's what the backstory is tied to and now it's up to that player to choose which information to dispense in the way their character would dispense it. So as the DM, I'm not like, Ian's character tells you this, because now that's taking away from immersion and storytelling details. Instead, it's like, Ian, your character would know this, but I get to whisper it ahead of time so that that way, like Ian gets to speak in character or write in character in chat is how we usually do it. You know, what information? Now, I also... One of my expectations is that that I didn't really even know I had until it came up was that when this happens, it's up to the player character. They're, they're almost like responsible for the party at that point to be the guide into this new realm, right? And I, I saw it work brilliantly with, um, with the Titanwood uh, game, the one you guys were a part of, which is like, listen, Moo comes from here. Uh, Jen's character also comes from a nearby town. Like Fennec, which is Adam's character, and Zoe, which is uh, other Stephanie's character, um, they aren't used to this area. So they have to rely on the information I gave Ian and Jen and their characters that they're dispensing to guide them into this new thing, which now gives you two perspectives, that of the person returning home and the person who's a newcomer, you know? So, and you get a really fresh perspective a mix of perspectives and you get a very cool story out of that too now what happened with this latest game is we had a player who was from the main region and i would whisper him details and he'd be like good to know but then he wouldn't tell the party <laughs> so the party was like hey we're new here do you know stuff and he's like yeah and it's like do you, do you want to tell him <laughs> like, so it was it was like i hadn't done a good job as a dungeon master being like this is my expectation that you have to be the guide to this people and you're going to be usually the front man in a few conversations and you know you have a lot of this relevant information to use but then they wouldn't tell the party for the party to use only they could use it so it is kind of interesting like it, it wasn't really designed to be a secret but it mostly ended up being but i also thought that was a cool way of using backgrounds that i had never really seen used as in depth which is your character gets extra information. How do they choose to help the party in this social interaction way in addition to their mechanical role? Yeah, we had that in, uh, in it worked really well in Grey's chapter two when we introduced the noble courts, which a lot of the other characters would have zero knowledge on anyway. So I felt confident you would need a guide in order to hide in plain sight in that space. So the characters of Sieve and Knox who are in that world and then the NPC Melisande mm -hmm are in the noble court. So they already have, they had like someone, I think it was Shelly that pointed out, oh my gosh, you have a document. Like they had a physical document of these are all the people in the court. These are what they do. This is how they work. And this is what they're going to talk to. And it allowed a, a defensible position so that they could outfit everyone in a certain way so that they could basically hide in plain sight at the gala. And it, it worked really well to help establish their, um, value to the party, but also made it so they were sort of responsible for them. We they were even framed as wards uh, for these these nobles. Um, that got a little more complicated as time went on, but that we we keep referencing Grace Chapter Two as a really good moment where things really synergized. And I wonder if that was also one of the qualities we had two players that knew more that could mm. be adequate guides and were responsible for everyone else. Yeah. Uh, what I really like about moments like that is that it's not just you giving them details that they might not otherwise be privy to, 
uh, if they weren't from the region. It's also allowing them to have the opportunity to, to create part of the world for you and, and add to it. So for example, um, in, in Moo's case with, um, with the Titanwood, he was talking about like, oh, I traveled there after the war um, and I don't have a lot of memories from it for some reason or another. We don't really know why. Um, but I do have memories of the mists, which is like what ended the war. And that, uh, and this was something that you hadn't said before. I, I said, Mu detected uh, large changes in temperature that uh, like it was very fluctuating inside the mists and it didn't really affect him or anything, but it just made, it, it was just like an interesting physical observation that not a lot of people might notice because they could be transformed by the mist otherwise. Um, another thing was uh, working together with another player who was from the region. Through that, uh, like we created uh, more backstory than I had thought of, which was that Mu had been to the village before, but he didn't really remember. He just, knowed, he just knew that he had been there uh, and that he had traveled through there on his way to the Titanwood. And, uh, apparent, and the other player you know, picked that up beautifully. Uh, she was just like, oh, so that's what that was like so many years ago how, that like there was this weird figure that wandered through our village and we all thought we were going to die or something <laughs> like it was it was a pretty cool moment. So I, I really like I really like it when uh, when not only are are the players experiencing the world that you've built for them, but they're also adding to it. Um, and it's one of those lessons that I've actually learned from a different uh, podcast uh, called Advantage. Uh, they're really good at that kind of thing. Yeah, I find it, it really helps not only ground players in the world. So like allow, like not only give player investment, but it kind of like helps play. It also, like you said, helps players kind of flesh out the story in a unique way. Because it's one thing for me as the DM to be like, this is what this place is like. It's another thing for uh, for Moo or, uh, or Jen's character, Kayleen, to be like, oh, this is this was my, I loved, you know, baking pies out at the oven. And we had these great herbs that we would add to our food to like enhance the flavor. It's those kind of like sensory, very personal touches that, uh, that brings the story to life in a way that a planned description that we passively read and then go over doesn't really, doesn't really immerse ourselves with, you know? Um, so, so this next part is really, has to do with how combat went. Um, this session had two combats. One that was a little bit more, you know, minion, like bunch of minions, real easy skirmish, and then a boss fight. And, uh, and actually this party had a lot of trouble in both fights. Um, and I think, and again, this was a, a, an expectation thing that kind of clarified for me that I have to step out of the game to like to say, which is, Sometimes the best mechanical choice is a narrative choice, right? Or the narrative, like, keys you in on mechanics. So one of the things that, um, that came up was they fought magma methods. And magma methods, I gave them additional properties because their default stat block didn't fulfill the narrative that I thought they would give. So first, they were fighting on a wooden stage in a theater. Whenever the magma methods would step down, they'd light that part of the stage on fire because they're made of magma. Yeah. The other thing is that whenever they'd hit them with a, with a metal weapon, or if the, the methods hit a metal piece of uh, equipment or armor, the, that thing, that item, would instantly fall under the effect of a heat metal spell. So mm -hmm. the idea isn't run up and stab the, the monster made of magma with my sword, because now the sword superheats, right? Yeah. Um, it was the, the strategy was to fight at a distance and fight with spell casting. That was like a very narrative thing where I'm like, by the way, um, your weapons will superheat. And they're like, well, maybe I can take the damage. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> so they just kind of tanked through oh. that fight. And they were thinking cool. through their mechanics. What is going, what is going to make my character going to do mechanically well? not what makes sense based on the narrative clues I've been given. And this culminated in the last fight where we, we had a moment where it was a good 10 minute pause of what is the perfect spell? What feature do I have that fits this situation? Um, and, uh, and what happened was the bard had 
really just kind of made an assumption about how the enemy PC would work. And she went invisible, ran straight up, and tried to bestow curse as the opening move. And the problem was this creature had magic resistance because they hadn't dealt her any damage yet. Yeah. <laughs> so because they hadn't, and, and this is like the fourth three-act structure fight that I've ran. And that, that structure runs beautifully for rewarding players for creative stuff towards the climax of the fight. Yeah. But we were at the beginning of the fight. So she, she tried to blow her biggest spell on, on a creature that had a high wisdom save and magic resistance. The spell failed. And the bard spent the entire fight out of position, getting knocked down and then trying to heal back up for minimal hit points. So the sorcerer also didn't prepare a lot of area of effect when there was a lot of minions in this fight. So like he's sitting there trying to be like, what's the perfect spell? What do I do? Do I have a spell that distracts her? And the answer wasn't a spell. The answer was to start your turn by saying, hey lady, get over here. And it would have angered her enough that she would have taken her attention away from the bard. Yeah. That, and as the DM, I didn't want to step in and be like, you know what you should do? Because now you're kind of railroading your players into the right choice instead of an interesting choice. You know, right. Interesting choices are ones where a player has to prioritize different amounts of risk and reward. Do I go with the, high, the choice that's high risk, high reward, like the bestow curse uh, opening? Or do I go with the choice that's low risk, but the reward isn't as big, you know? That's really the, the analysis you're going through. And, and what ended up happening was, um, yeah, not, not all questions are answered by attacks or spells. That's what Ian just kind of popped into chat there. Yeah. What, what ended up happening is they, they forgot that they could ask questions and they really were relying on the features written on their character sheet to win the fight when really this was a battle of wits not a battle of not a battle of, of, of mechanics or attack rolls, you know? I think that's pretty interesting because it speaks uh, to me particularly well because of uh, how my original D and D uh, experiences went. So in the first time that the first time I ever tried to play D and D, we were doing Lost Minds of Fen, and in the beginning of the spoiler alert. In the beginning of the, uh, you know, campaign, there's like a potential to be ambushed by goblins or something. We had a character on our, on our team who didn't really want to pick a fight um, or anything like that. And they were trying to persuade the goblins uh, to not fight them. But the DM, and I don't know if it was me or somebody else, but I remember that whoever DM'd didn't allow the, the player to make a persuasion check because we just assumed that this is like you know it's very tropish to just kill goblins when they attack you you know like we were all stuck in that mindset of this is battle you should probably defend yourself as opposed to you should talk your way out of this and so we just completely ignored skills uh and had that player forego their turn essentially because it because we just ignored that we just totally forgot about it so for me, it's really important when my player is trying to do something kind of out of the box, even from what I've planned, um, and they want to do something, uh, for example, pushing the limits of a spell, which Adam often allows us to make checks for, or uh, you know, intimidating. Uh, just in this last uh, one-shot session, the second half of it, um, I <laughs> it was pretty funny. One of the players used thaumaturgy to try and intimidate the uh, the opponent which is like this monster thing. And they shouted at, shouted in celestial at them to like strike the fear of God into their heart or something. And I had them roll a, an intimidation check and they got like a nat 20 or something. So I was like, okay, that creature is now frightened. Uh, and it was really funny because it was the final fight too. So, <laughs> so I allowed that to happen, but it's not like I was just saying, uh, you can or can't do it. It was, I, there's a chance it su could succeed. So I'll have you roll for it. And so that's, that's what I really find interesting is this game rewards creativity. Um, as long as there's a chance it'll succeed, you might as well try. So that's, that's my perspective on it. A lot of what I see uh, at the, the table is a, um, when we get stuck in that, almost like a choice paralysis, but really uh, trying to find the best spell, the best idea. And uh, there are, sometimes players get closed into their features and they're not paying attention to the environment 
or to the, the other organic social nature that can exist inside combat, where it's like, I, I love it when a, when a player, instead of them going, oh, I don't have a feature that lets me intimidate them, so I'll just hit them. It's like, do you want to yell at them? Yeah, I'll yell at them. Yeah, I roar in their face. Okay, make an intimidation check. And it's like, oh, I can just do that? Yes, yeah, you can just do that. And understanding that, oh, I can just talk to them or I can just yell at them or I want to cause a distraction, uh, but I don't want to give away. Wait, is there a rock nearby? You pick up a rock and I throw it over in that other direction and try to make noise over there and distract the, the creature. Um, or if you're fighting on a ship and there's a big mast and oh, I knock down the mast or I hit the rope on the sail. I try to drop the sail on it. it there, there might be other options that are more than just just the things that my character can do and only my character can do and that's all I can do. There's so much more when we start to expand our breadth of uh, the environment and uh, about the, the personalities, the traits of the, the creatures we might be fighting or interacting with and our allies as well. Uh, communication helps a bunch in this, um, but uh, recognize, I think that upgrade uh, for your own abilities is really cool to be able to look at. Sometimes the best option is maybe not enacting a feature, it's interacting mm -hmm. with the environment. And then the next round, maybe it's time for that feature, but it's, you're gonna do it moment to moment. So as a DM, your job is on top of rules adjudication, world building, all that stuff, um, adjudicating in a way that rewards the habits that you want to see from your players. And to me, what this spoke to was that these players, when they tried creative stuff, were discouraged from trying that. So they, they were rewarded when they went with their mechanical features. The rules is written. So that's what they, that's what they started with you know, so they had been, they had been rewarded so much with using the stuff on their character sheet. They didn't even consider something outside of it because they weren't so like, like Ian's example, like, let's say I had a player try to talk to them and I was like, okay, you spend your turn doing that. And it doesn't work. Now they don't want to even try again because they've wasted their turn. They, they don't get a chance to do anything else and they might die. <laughs> so it's like the ultimate punishment for trying something creative or um or when they try to use a creative use of a spell and the the dc for making the the creative use is high enough that it's almost like it, it can't work you know that now punishes that player from from doing that and it discourages that habit of creativity so it's ha the question I, I kept asking myself how do i rule things in a way that encourage my players to adopt the habits I would like seeing in my game, you know? So if I wanna see more social interaction be a part of combat, then I can't punish players for wanting to do that, for wanting to talk to the goblin. I have to let them try to make the persuasion check. And if it fails, I, I, I'm now like, oh, now I let them use their action and bonus action. Or you just make it clear up front what the cost is gonna be. So now it's like, oh, it might take your bonus action to try to climb this random thing, even though you've used all your movement, you know? So it's, it's how, how do you like clearly create those expectations? And actually this was a funny session. I know Stephanie just left the room, but so just to give a little bit of a story recap, very quick summary. Um, this chapter was called The Devil's Mercy because it was based on, it, it, it revolved around this play that, you know, I, I kind of like, it was a fictional play based on Faustus, if you guys have ever read it. But basically it was, um, there was a village that was wracked by a plague. So uh, the local doctor uh, couldn't come up with a solution. So he prayed to the archdevil Mephistopheles to cure the plague. And Mephistopheles being an archdevil was like, yeah. Um, and the, he, he was like, basically, when you die, I get your soul. That's, that was the whole thing. So the villagers, when they realized that the guy made a deal with the devil, um, tried to find him to kill him. And they didn't. They found his wife. So they tried to burn his wife at the stake. And he basically, the devil was like, listen, I'll go back on our deal. I'll save your wife and everything if you let your whole village die. And he's like, no, I won't forsake the people. 
So the, the guy was like, okay. And the guy ended up dying from the plague. <laughs> and then the, the devil got his soul, right? And then he went to the wife who was burning at the stake. And he's like, hey, um, by the way, I'll give you the, I'll, I'll give you basically the power of a devil so that, you know, their, their pitchforks won't hurt you in the, in your immune to fire. Um, all you got to do is I'll just do that for you if you want. And she was basically like, well, what'd my husband choose? And he's like, uh, he chose the people. So she's like, fine, give me the powers of a devil. And he didn't ask her to, she just slaughtered the village because she was so angry which of course allowed him to collect the souls. <laughs> yep. So I presented this entire like scene, like this really long written out dialogue. And I'm like, I'm, all my players were like, neat, you spent a lot of time on that. And then I presented the, the big bad boss lady was a devil woman who was talking, referencing the play. She had written the play herself. And they're like, huh, I wonder what her weakness is. And then they started trying, like, it's like, eventually this one was like, wait a minute, what if that play was a clue? Like, it's like, <laughs> and then, uh, that, that ended up being the answer. If you use parts of the play as the clue. I'm just saying, I was the barbarian. I wasn't supposed to be the smart one. Yeah. <laughs> so all of a sudden, it, it now became like, oh, wait, we can use the clues from the play to help us talk our way out of this fight you know and as soon as they started talking with references to what happened in the play all the fighting stopped you know it was a combat that could have been completely circumnavigated because social interaction was the real final fight um and uh I'm saying friendship was the real reward John. yeah but anyway it was magic so um so what it did is it did highlight a few like ian and i had a quick back and forth on some lore things about how devils work in this world and that was something i had to do all the time is i, I made it clear that the planes don't work in this world like they do in default D, &D lore there's the material plane that's all anybody knows about they might theorize about different planes but as far as they know, like plane shift the spell doesn't work because what do you shift to? There's nothing. <laughs> so, um, so what this ultimately culminated to was a, um, the, the woman who had wrote the play based on her own experiences, she had lived centuries after this tragedy had happened, um, had made a deal with Mephistopheles to get her husband's soul back. And basically what he wanted was all of the souls of the capital city. And so um, she had already, he had, she had already like done that deal and everything and the ritual was underway. And the party in the middle of it, um, the, the arch devil ended up getting summoned to that, uh, to that where, where they were fighting, you know, in the catacombs. And the, the woman ended up dying in the middle of it. And he's like, great, I get another soul, cool. <laughs> So, um, so the party was faced with a decision. It was, do we make a deal with this devil and somehow give him something to not take the entire souls of everybody in the capital city? Or do we try to stand our ground? And that to me, what, there was a lot of frustration on the player end of it because it was a morally ambiguous choice where there wasn't a clear win. You know, mm. it wasn't like do this thing and you win a hundred percent. Kobayashi Maru the thing and you win a hundred percent. The, the de definition of a tragic choice is where you make the choice and there isn't a clear benefit, you know? Mm. And I think those are some of the most powerful decisions in storytelling, um, which is, you know, if you look back at the main character of this play that this session was about, you know, he made a deal with the devil, but he saved his village, you know? So what would you do to save other people? Or do you not save other people? And do you act selfishly because they're going to get what they deserve anyway? Mm -hmm. So, um, so, and that ended up being a very interesting kind of conflict with, um, you know, we had one player who was strictly, I will not make a deal with the devil. And it's like, all right, then everybody you ever knew or studied with dies because he already signed his, his contract. You're basically asking for a new contract. Um, we had other players that were like, oh, we have this magic book we can give him that basically has a ledger of the true names of every archdevil. Like, <laughs> do, is that something? And he, that was what he ultimately was like, oh, yeah, if you trade me that, I won't mess with these souls anymore. So right. where do you, what are you willing to compromise 
in order to try to get a better outcome. What makes an interesting choice doesn't have to be trans- tragic consequences. It's just it, because you don't want to uh, put your players into the position of what is the best, like, I'm sorry, what is the good choice? What's the bad choice? Uh, it's, it's just, there are, there are choices and there are choices and they have different outcomes. Uh, I like that in, um, it was very important that I took a break from, from running a lot of my big games because it helped me clarify where it was that those choice points got sort of lost in the shuffle uh, and where um, uh, I can show more and, and tell less, uh, like show the players the, the consequences to their choices, whether those choices happened long ago or they're immediate. And we had a great game last night that I won't go into for now, but uh, a choice was made and it had a, a few tragic consequences, but still they stood by that choice. They thought it was the best choice given the opportunities presented, uh, even though it may have set other things in motion that could be terrible. Uh, it was still the best choice for them, but it doesn't have to be the best choice as in the good choice, the bad choice, it was what they believed to be the best choice based on the information that they had and their beliefs and their development so far, their characters. There's a lot of information that came into that decision as well as timing. And it doesn't, I'm not going to sit there and, and say, yes, that was the best choice or no, that was a bad choice. It was just, there are now consequences and they're going to play out this way because you made this choice at this time. And I, yeah, and it's really I interesting to me. That's the big thing with the tragic consequence. It's what are you willing to give up to get a better, a better outcome, you know? Yeah. And, and I had one player who was like, basically after like, I should have outthunk this problem. There should have, there, there must have been a solution that was better. And, and really in game time, they had 15 seconds to figure it Ooh, out. They had, fi- yeah. they had a very strict time limit. This was like, uh, if you've ever watched Full Metal Alchemist, that was literally the image I showed them was Xerxes and the countrywide transmutation circle of Ooh. everybody's about to be sacrificed, you know? Yeah. So they had to give up something pretty big um, in order to, uh, to get something. So, and, and I think that, again, that is a, a scenario. I'm very, it energizes me to see how players resolve that and what players are willing to give up in order to have a better outcome. But Again, I think a lot of the players were uncomfortable with that and they didn't, they didn't know how to handle it. They didn't know how to navigate it, you know? So when, when that decision came up, it was like, it was like a shock, like, oh no, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, that reminds me of how Eld's story played out when he uh, sacrificed his heart in order to come back uh, to the material plane instead of, um, you know, moving on and, and entering the Feywild to be part of the, part of the, the, um, Ice Maiden's court there. Um, you, you, for me, it's about it, it's about giving up when you give up something and you're confronted by these choices. It's about what is going to make the most most interesting story for me, anyway. And what, like, not just not just the consequences, like what those consequences will play into even later on. I think my words are getting jumbled here. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, for me, it's like, how, how am I furthering the story by making this choice? And what is going to come, come of it? Because at the end of the day, you know, you, sometimes you got to take a step back and remember that you are trying to play a game. And for me, this game is very much about storytelling. Uh, and even if my character, you know, suffers, even if my character dies in the end, um, I, I'm just trying to make it as fulfilling as possible. So, I don't know, like, it, morally gray, morally in, uh, gray, uh, you know, choices and things like that. In the end, as long as I make a choice with it, <laughs> like, like, I don't, as long as I'm not, like, as long as the DM doesn't, like, punish me for making a choice that they perceive as wrong or something, um, then I, you know, I don't mind. <laughs> There's a, a point there where um, uh, I, I was discussing with a, a player before I was taking my, my break where they were actually uh, concerned about coming back and playing uh, in a campaign uh, because they, um, they had cultivated so much character development and felt like they were 
fulfilled or at least uh, happy with where their character was at, at that point in time, that to play again, it runs the risk of terrible things happening to the things that they built up. That they're con so concerned with the possibility of losing all of that that stuff or those connections or those that development that you know they they could die their character could die their all of their allies could die in this dark and grim world that i that they didn't even want to play and i i had to bring up that with my players specifically it goes back to my blog post on boundaries you didn't sign up for an abusive experience you didn't sign up for me to like punish you over and over again for making what you thought was the right choice there. It can still be a dark world without me like giving you no way out and you must choose between the life of your, your loved ones or this thing. It's like, I will make sure that there's a, at least three instances down the path. If you're going to make a bad choice, if you're going to make like the terrible decision, that's awful. You know, it's, it's just, there needs to be a logical through line. So I had to like bring that up again uh, as a way to reassure some players that it's okay. Yes. This there, there could be terrible things that happen, but I'm not going to like take your favorite NPC and kill them off screen just because I want to punish you. You know, it's, it's not going to be that way. Uh, there, there might be odds stacked against you, but you can rise to that challenge. And I'm not going to make it so it's an impossible no-win scenario. If you played with me long enough, you know there's always another option. And I'm trying to be clearer and clearer that there are, there are other ways uh, around this stuff. So in that same vein, when we're talking about tragic consequences, it doesn't necessarily mean that you made this choice. Now everyone you know and love dies just because it was the tragic choice. It, it's, that's not what we're getting at. It's that there's, there's a weight to things and that there are still consequences and it shouldn't be just like, it, this isn't the snap. It isn't just suddenly everyone is dead. Rocks fall, everyone dies. I hate that. It's stupid. There needs to be at least three instances, possibly more, especially in that dark cloak and dagger type campaign, where there's going to be a logical point where you can go back in those decisions like, this is why this happened, this is why this happened, and this is what brought us to this point. Do you still want to continue? Or do you want to make a different choice or research something or stop for a moment and try to figure it out? Yeah, and, um, and I think when I'm talking about a tragic choice, um, I'm talking about a narrative device of the structure of the choice, not whether it's the good or bad one, kind of like what you've been saying. So like a tragic choice is that um, there, there is going to have to be something given up and there's going to have to be something gained, right? But uh, the idea being like, all right, here's a real classic one. You, you do Batman and Robin, right? And you've got Two, two women hanging by the, the Joker has been like, oh, you can save only one of them. And if, if you choose one, the other dies. There are going to be consequences either way. But, you know, the fact that you have to give up something in, in either case, even though you get something, that's the definition of a tragedy, right? And Adam, the, the issue you were speaking to really is, that's an indication that at some point, maybe without even fault of your own, trust had been severed somehow, right? Where there was, a, there was a, a deterioration of that trust. It may not have been gone completely. It's just, it was just somehow damaged. And a lot of times it's a manifestation of something that's happening outside of the game. I've found most of the time anyway. Mm. But um, the way you build that truck, that truck, that trust back up is through empathy, respect, and communication right? So you actually put it in a blog post that you did recently, which is respecting a character's build. You know, if a character is up front and they're like, I want to build a grappler build. And every single time they try to grapple, they fail. Now they're not going to try to grapple and they'll feel as if their build has been disrespected because they never get to do the thing they were built for. Yeah. Now that being said, sometimes it's inappropriate if it's a ghost and it's an immaterial object and you're like, <laughs> I grapple it and it fails. 
now you can't be like as a as a character you can be perplexed if you're playing an unintelligent character but as a player you might be like oh i i understand why this is more a what this is me playing my character more than it is you know so and that's <laughs> so so you know there there is a little bit of a give and take there mm. but but the idea being that like the the idea with the whole tragic consequence you made a decision that ended up working against you more than you thought it would if you as the dm have an open line of communication with each player and you're like listen this is going to cost you this this doesn't mean you lose everything you built up to like you said and let's let's look down the the train and as the dm these are like two or three things that you might be able to do to recover this situation. Yeah. Great example from a, from a game you ran was Cloud Singer when I made the mistake of throwing the crabs in the ocean because my character was told, don't throw the crabs in the ocean. My assumption, ha ha, was that if you throw the crabs in the ocean, they die. Well, no, they, they create a giant elemental tree of death, right? And you, the, the next thing my character said after he realized he made a mistake is, is there a way I can fix this? And as the DM, you created a scenario where I could fix it if I chose to. And that, that I think, is the big thing with D&D. Even if a character dies, that might not be the end for their character. It might be an adventure to find a, a phoenix down or a, or a character that yeah. can cast resurrection, you know? It doesn't have to be the end if it doesn't make sense story-wise. Yeah, and we, we brought it up uh, a couple episodes uh, ago that, uh, that came out uh, about you know what becomes possible if my character dies. And we brought up out a really interesting discussion, but actually it, it, it re-clarified for me. It's not about what happens when my uh, character dies. It actually scales back even further into, I want my players to be excited to play even if it's a dark world, even if it's a dark, dangerous world, even if there's the threat of them dying, I want them to be excited to play, not fearful of that death, not fearful of that loss or fearful of that tragedy, excited to experience whatever is going to happen. And in reestablishing that level of boundaries that you did not sign up for this, for an abusive experience, you signed up for a big story that has ups and downs and we're going to you know play through it and have a good time i'm not going to be cruel about it you can still make dark and heavy decisions but i'm not going to be cruel and that's a very different thing because you can be a wee kind of dm and still tell a dark story that's totally okay or you can be a mean dm and tell a dark story I'm not going to do that. And in doing that, it made it like it's okay for you to experience tragic things because we reestablished this is a game and it's going to be all right. And I'm not going to punish you for playing a game. And it was just interesting to need to clarify that, but I understand also why. Because so much of our lives right now is out of our control. And it's out of a lot of people's control. People feel helpless and powerless. And in their game, they don't want to feel out of control. And I can totally understand that need to reestablish the expectations. Because we, a lot of us play our games to escape. And we don't want our escapism to also be punishing and to make us feel bad, even if it's a dark story. It's an interesting thing because it brings me back to Curse of Strahd, which... Um, which uh, that campaign, we just put it on the side burner, you know, we're going to come back to it. I'm, I, I have strong determination to come back to that campaign. Uh, but uh, it's interesting because the, when tragic things happen, uh, it, it, it's important for players to keep in mind that if, a, if it's a like, skilled DM and they put your characters in a tragic situation or a dark situation, that there's probably a good reason. Now, the, this doesn't work for every kind of player. I think that uh, it speaks a little bit to how John was talking about creating healthy habits for, for players and stuff and then what you want to see in your games. Um, but like, for example, a tragic, a tragic incident might become motivating for a player or a player character. Um, just because uh, you know, you've known this PC for a while doesn't ha make them automatically have plot armor. Like 
they <laughs> like they might not be they might not be like as skilled as you and your party because they're not they're an npc they're not a pc they don't have all the skills of player characters but that uh, it's it's just very interesting to me because that npc is a plot device and i as the dm have kind of the right to treat it as such uh, so you can't like get mad at me if something happens to the npc but that doesn't mean I'm gonna be like, that doesn't mean I'm like overlording this or anything. It just means I have more in store for the story and part of it involves something that happens to this NPC. So it, like I said, yeah. all of this is about storytelling to me. Um, and there's always gonna be an overarching meaning to pretty much everything that I put into my games, especially with descriptions. Uh, <laughs> and I wanna make sure I'm absolutely clear that when I say, you know, you didn't, you didn't sign up for abuse, that doesn't mean that everyone is immune. And that certainly doesn't mean that your named NPCs are out of danger. It just means there will be a logical through line to the decisions that brought us to this point. It might put your NPCs in danger. We've had NPCs die. It's, they're, they're no, it's it, me stating that no one is safe is correct but there are creatures that are more safe than others and there are decisions that will have ripples and a lot of it when an information heavy campaign, you don't know everything. So you have to make choices because you're out of time and you have to make informed decisions based on the information that you have and that you've gathered. That means there, my players now fully understand that there are things in play that they don't know about and that's okay. The, the difference is when you're a player and something happens where you're like, I didn't expect that, is to then embrace it and rise to the challenge instead of stepping back and saying, oh, that's not fair, or oh, I don't want to play anymore, or oh, that didn't go the way I wanted to, so therefore I'm not going to, to do this anymore. And there's a, a difference where we are in our maturity level and where we are in our play style. There's a difference if there has been an erosion of that trust and uh, the relationships. That's all there. It's not, there's, this is not black and white. There's a lot of factors that come into play there. But I, I've even put it in my social contract for the next campaign that things can go wrong because there are factors you may not be aware of. And mm. if and when that happens, that you, in, you put on your investigation hat and you rise to the challenge and try to adapt instead of running away and, 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 or I'll phrase it better, but you know, instead of getting indignant about it, like, Oh, it's a no win scenario. Cause you don't like us and you just want us to fail. It's let's go into it from a story mm -hmm. perspective, instead of making it a meta gaming, putting me on the defensive. Yeah. And to kind of, kind of cap up both of your comments there, it all wraps back to how I started this, which is yeah. why I like online gaming better is <coughs> from the more storytelling <sighs> perspective, I have the opportunity to deliver a more cohesive, um, accountable storytelling experience. So it keeps me accountable of making sure all the details are right and I'm not forgetting anything. Mm -hmm. So one of the practices that I've done, and I don't know if I've talked about on the podcast too much, is... At the end of each session, I go back through the chat log and I format everything that happens as a short story available for both me and the players to read. Yeah. And what that does is if a player misspoke or, you know, really they would have said it differently based on what they knew, I can edit it. I can yeah. edit everything to basically be like we experienced the um the spontaneous act of play together and we're going to boil that down and refine it into a story that's still impactful and makes sense. Yeah. Um, and really it all comes back to that communication, right? So it's a way to communicate to the party, this is officially what happened. I know your character may have said it a little bit differently. And that's the other thing, I'm very, I am so like big into communication with this latest campaign. Like I'll even be like, listen, I'm planning on writing your character's line like this. Tell me if it's not okay, you know? And I've had players be like, you know, I don't think my character would sneer. I think they'd mischievously grin. And it's a little thing, but it, it has a big change. And it's like, okay, I'll go back and edit that so that that way we're on the same page. 
anything just because i say it doesn't mean it's it's set in stone that's why the even the short stories are a google drive document they're a live thing that can be mm -hmm. edited so if a player feels that i've somehow misrepresented their character or i didn't write them in a way that was respectful to the tone or archetype or whatever that they had planned they have input to how their character is portrayed which only allows them to immerse themselves more something when you're live and you're acting at the table that's something i can't do i can't go back through the chat log and i can't boil it back to a story that makes sense and make sure that all of the portrayals are respectful i can only kind of remember things that happen and do my best to pick up from where we left off yeah. um and even when it comes to character deaths like like to me it's still that communication the character dies i have a conversation with the with the character because think about the backstories you guys have made and if i just ripped that away from you because you had a bad dice roll or the dm didn't balance the encounter the correct way you know they made an administrative mistake so your story pays the price mm -hmm. you know that's where the communication comes in is it okay if your player if your character stays dead is that okay with everybody else that their character stays dead or doesn't or, or needs to be revivified or whatever, you know? So is the tone that we want to play something where death might have a little bit less of a consequence? Or would that ruin our, our immersion and our expectations because, you know, we're, we want a more serious game where death has a heavier consequence? And that's something you can keep checking in on. It's the beauty of running it like a one shot, you know, where there's a beginning, middle and end, because during the transition between the end of one session and the beginning of the next, if we need to come together and be like, you know, guys, I didn't realize you, you wouldn't, it would, it would frustrate you that much to make a choice like that. My next session, I won't do that. I was playing something new, but it's not going to have so much consequence that, you know, it, we've, we've had that experience. We've got the beginning, the middle and the end let's move on from here or you know what i wasn't expected i was going to be challenged in that way i give you props for coming up with that challenge i give you props for creating that puzzle the way that you did next time when we face a similar challenge we'll be better equipped to overcome it you know that's it's it's getting that immediate feedback right after which sh demonstrates that you're respecting their character yeah. and can only lead to more trust and satisfying play on the other end of it Thank you very much for tuning in to today's episode of the DM Shower Thoughts. You can find the DM Shower Thoughts on its YouTube channel, DM Shower Thoughts. Go look for its new content whenever it posts. And uh, you can find uh, me and my um, wonderful, wonderful blogs uh, where uh, we share content uh, also over at John's Study Hall, uh, as well as um, notes from The Apprentice for uh, every now and then from Ian and then my GM's Corner. Uh, also, that is the place where you can find, uh, some of you mentioned Grey Owls, and I'm uh, writing lots of short stories for that. So you can find Grey Owls fiction over at the Grey Owls Initiative under the Night Owls tab. And this podcast uploads every Friday or so uh, over on Podbean at noon and over at um, iTunes at uh, around noon. Whenever it posts on Podbean, it automatically goes up on iTunes. Have a wonderful day, everyone. And please, game responsibly. Bye-bye now.